Okay, so lecture number two. Tonight we're going to start off talking about the lab content because I realized that from someone already bringing it up that there was already a lab due, which again is the the first lab that we're going to do is not is not overly difficult. So the first lab is really more of just did you process kind of what we talked about tonight? And then, so it shouldn't be a real big deal to, 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 to knock out the pennies lab that were that, that I put down for being due on Friday. I can, I'll move it out to Sunday. So I'll give you an extra day or two to, to do the pennies lab. It, it's not a real big deal. All right, so under the lab section, okay. So under the lab section, this is the main lab format. So when you do a lab report, Okay, all of the labs, with the exception of the pennies lab, you will do a formal lab report. Okay, so that means that it will follow this prescribed format. All right, so there are examples. Okay, so if you click on the sample lab reports, you will see essentially what these, what it will look like. So you have the title, the purpose, the procedure, the data section, and the conclusion. And so then there's stuff in there for sample calculations and things. If you look at the other lab report, you have this, you'll see the same format, title, the purpose, procedure, section for pre-lab questions, your data section that you will fill in, and then a conclusion, okay? So the lab reports are not overly long, okay? They're not meant to be a long thing. Okay, so a lot of the report writing is some of an exercise in brevity. Okay, so we have to learn to be concise, All right? So we'll talk about that here in a second. All right, so as you'll see here for the pennies lab, there is a separate page that brings you over to the graphing tutorial and it basically sets up what I'm looking for for, for the pennies lab. So we'll come back to that in a minute, All right? But every lab, you'll find there's going to be some amount of information. So, so like some of them have written up pages. So some of them have pages that I've written up with further explanation. I, I haven't done that for all of them, obviously. So you'll see for the first two, there's a little bit more of an in-depth page on what, are, what I'm looking for, rather than some of these other ones where there's not a lot of stuff there. There's basically just the, the document and things like that. But we will go over every lab before you do it. Okay, so at some point, probably on the Monday of every week, I will probably take a few minutes to walk through the lab. Because most of these are pretty much set up to where we're going to have a lab every week. So if we look over at the calendar real quick, let's take a look at the what's on the calendar here. All right, so so here's the pennies lab doing the 22nd. Okay, so here we are on the 19th. All right, so the calendar is going to get populated with the Zoom meetings. So it's, it's going to be busy on here pretty quick. All right, so next week we have the physical properties lab. So that means probably I'll have to take some time later in the week and look at the physical properties lab before that date. So, I mean, I, I can always push it out to like, you know, the Saturday or something like that. Again, everything virtual. So the actual deadlines that I put on here are more notional than anything else. Um, again, we have our first quiz next week on chapter one, which again, we haven't really gotten into yet. So it's not a whole lot of time. Um, but every week you'll see, okay, there's a physical properties lab, the prep room solutions. Then we have, have our first exam. So, and you'll see the exams are spaced. So here's about two weeks in, about two weeks, you know, and so then that wraps us up. So there's, you know, pretty much ends us up right at the six weeks here. So there's not a whole lot of space in there. So the exams are spaced kind of as well as I could and without having them right on top of one another. Plus there's a nomenclature quiz in here. So I tried only to do the one quiz a week so we're not doing like multiple quizzes in a week. There's 
Although there is a the science literacy quiz, I don't know if that's something we have to do. This was something that we did in the in the spring. It's it's really it's like a standardized kind of thing that they do across the the, de the department. So every chemistry class takes it, and so it's it's kind of like a uh, think of it like a standardized test kind of thing. It's like a metric of like how well everybody's using it. In the past, they've done a variety of these kinds of things where they would give me questions and I would put them on my test. And then I would just keep track of the metrics of how many students answered X question on the test and then reported back. And then that way they could compile and see kind of like how many people are getting this question right. And, and I mean, I don't know what they use it for, but obviously like various internal metrics and things like that of tracking student progress and things, right? So. And then there's a journal article review in here. And then the second journal article review. Again, these are relatively short assignments. So, but we will have to kind of keep on top. So this is gonna be a busy week in here because there's gonna be a whole bunch of assignments in that one week. All right, but I tried to space it as best as I, best I could. Again, if there's suggestions of when, when you'd rather have stuff due. Again, the exams don't have to be due these days i mean i can obviously i can push them back to like a like a saturday again the the way i did it in the spring was i did it two over two days so the exam was available like for two days so it wasn't just like the 18th there'd be the 18th and the 19th and so you could take it anywhere in those two days okay so again i can do the same kind of thing where we can spread it out you have the two days to take the exam um, so again, those are options. All right. All right. So let's look back at the, all right. So we got sample lab reports. Again, this is kind of what I'm expecting you to give me. Each lab has its own set of documents as well as guidelines and videos. And then down here at the bottom is where you you're where you're going to go to submit those documents. All right. So submitting documents, you you want to try and submit one document. I, I don't. I guess I am a little more critical on what I ask for submission in my 112 class. So one document is best. Okay. So presume preferably it's not like because I'm asking for four pages that I don't get four separate documents for every page. Right, so you can put it all into one Word document kind of thing and upload it as one thing. You can PDF the whole thing, however you want to do it, but it's preferably it's one document that I don't have to click around to different documents to, to get every page of your report, okay? Uh, it does allow multiple pages to be submitted. Mm, oh, so, yeah, so there's a question for the set date for the final exam. And it's not really set, I just, I put it on the last day of the class because um, I we need to have grades and things like that done. So I just, I put it at the last day of the class. It'll probably be two days there at the end. So for the Penny Lab, uh, what type of format would you like to submit? Um, preferably for most of the labs, it'll be a Word document. No, as in like, you said we don't have to do like the procedure and stuff for the Penny Lab. Right, right, we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second. Yeah, it's because the Penny's Lab is more focused on the graphing and did you understand what I said about what, what I'm going to say about the conclusion writing? Okay, so it's, it's mostly just a check, like did you, did you hear, did you catch everything that, that I'm gonna talk about tonight? And then, then that way if, like, if you totally miss the mark, then I can change and provide added guidance for the actual first real lab. So it's kind of just like a half lab to see where, where, what everybody caught as I was giving the lecture. And then if somebody didn't understand, then we can make adjustments before we do the reverse first lab. Okay, all right, so let's look at the, my PowerPoint here for the lab reports. Oops. All right, so this is the PowerPoint that, that's loaded on the page. Again, most of these are more for if we're doing the, 
doing the lab report in class. There's more to this if it's in, in class lab report kind of stuff. Okay, so each lab report you're gonna do is a formal lab report. Again, with the exception of the penny lab. Okay, uh, the only real requirement that I'm really not looking for are my pages. So every, every lab has kind of a PDF that goes with it. I just don't wanna see my PDF back. Okay, so you gotta write your own report when you submit your, your report, okay? Uh, again, the whole individual work thing is a little less of an issue because we're not actually working in groups. That's more of like a thing if like you guys are working with, with a group or partners. And so here you'll see the same, same setup, name, title, purpose, procedure, pre-lab questions, data section, and conclusions. This is the lab report format, right? So the purpose, when we, when we do each lab, I will talk about what is the purpose of doing the experiment. The purpose is generally not the objectives that are listed on, on the top of the paper, okay? If you look at any of the lab report documents, which we can look at one here shortly, they list a lot of things like the objectives or to like learn how to use glassware and things like that. That's not, that's not the purpose of doing the experiment, okay? So I will generally give you what is the purpose of doing the experiment. For most of the experiments that we're going to do, the purpose is to identify a solution, is to identify an unknown, determine a concentration, there's a reason why we're doing the experiment. We're not doing the experiment to, to play with chemicals, right? That's not, that's not why we do lab work, right? So when you go to the doctor, they're not taking a blood test and running a bunch of blood tests because they want your money, okay? I mean, they get that on the side, but that's not the purpose of doing the blood work, right? The, purpose, the blood work has a purpose for diagnosing your, your health. Right, so the, the objectives that are stated sometimes in the labs are not the actual purpose of doing the experiment, okay? All right, the procedure, you have the lab handouts, okay? So your, your procedure that you write, okay, just shouldn't be my PDF, okay, or C lab handout. You can paraphrase, the procedure, you can bulletize it, you can copy it word for word, okay? I just don't wanna see my documents given back to me, okay? So you just need to have a procedure section. I don't care how you get that procedure section, just as long as I'm not looking at my PDF documents or Word documents that I gave you, okay? That's the only thing I don't want for the procedure. Everything else, as long as you have a procedure section, you could bulletize it, you know, each one of the steps, you took this chemical here and you added this chemical here and you mix this chemical here and you got, and, the, and this, you know, input data, right? So as long as there is a set of procedures that walks you through the lab. Now, one of the labs we're gonna do focuses on writing procedures, okay? On writing the SOP, the standard operating procedure for the experiment, okay? So I've picked a couple of labs where the focus of the report is slightly different, where in some labs, the focus is gonna be on the conclusion, okay? So like the, the Penny's lab, the focus is really on the conclusion. In another lab, it's more on the data processing. How do you handle the data and you putting the, all of the pieces together? In other labs, you'll look at, again, the conclusion, right? So the spectroscopy lab, okay? If you look at the spectroscopy lab later on, I give you all the data, okay? Everything's done for you. The only thing that's missing is the conclusion. So you have to look at all the data, figure out what that means, and then write a conclusion, okay? So there's different ways to approach the lab reports when we're not physically mixing chemicals, all right? And so this is the same kind of thing I do in the regular semester is to look at different ways of approaching the, uh, the work. And so one of the labs, look specifically at the procedure. So there really isn't a conclusion because you're making solutions. And so it is more about how you went about writing up the procedures. 
can someone read your procedure and understand what you're writing? Okay, so the procedure section for most of the labs will be given to you and you will kind of figure it out and then you can just put it, make sure it gets into your report, right? Most labs come with pre-lab questions. They're somewhere in the handout. The Penny's lab doesn't have questions, okay? So you don't have to put questions in there. But most of the other labs, there are, if there's a handout that has pre-lab questions in it, you will include the questions with your report, okay? They don't have to be done before the lab. They are not turned in separately. They are included with your report, okay? Your data section. Again, most of the handouts have a pre-organized data table. You just have to recreate that, okay? So you redraw it in your, in your Word document, pencil everything in, okay? But you'll have your own data section. There may or may not really be calculations for some of these. Uh, again, most of that may be, maybe your Excel sheet is your data table, okay? But there is a data section, okay? Again, the only thing I don't want is my lab handouts given back to me or, you know, pictures of, of your, your lab reports, okay? So pre presumably we can manage to get that all into one, one document. Okay. I have a question. Sure. So for the data section, are you saying like for instance, a pennies lab, you put in a whole bunch of masses of different pennies over the years. So just if that's fine, if we just copy that into an Excel and that would be our data section basically, and then putting right. that into Word. Okay. Right. Right. So, so if you copy that in over into Word, that, that could be your data section. Right. Now, obviously the challenge though is going, if you're going to put it all into Word is getting it to look good. Right. Now, obviously you can, in this case, you can probably attach it as a separate Excel sheet with, with the data finished, right? Maybe you put your graphs into, into a Word document, all right? Or you put everything into a Word document, right? So it's just, this is where we have to work on some of our soft skills, right? So there are all kinds of things that we have to learn as we are in, in college or as we go to working for real in real jobs is, putting stuff together so that it doesn't look like you did it in crayon, right? Is your graphs actually fit onto the page. It's not like shifted off and like your graph goes and then I can't see anything over here because there's a whole bunch of stuff over here that didn't make it on your page. Your data table like isn't, you know, actually fits on the page and isn't like missing stuff, right? So working on our soft skills so that it looks nice, okay? If you have to break up the data table in different ways, again, you have to kind of be creative to get it in into the document if you're gonna if you're gonna put it all into a document, okay? So uh, so yeah, so some of the labs again, since we are working virtually, a lot of them will have data tables that are Excel sheets. You can give me the Excel data sheet. That's fine, okay? Um, for for other ones where I'm giving you giving you data and that stuff that you would fill into a data table. Uh, on in the PDF. I just don't want my PDF handed back to me. Okay, so you would just recreate the data table in Word. Do you have okay. any questions sure. um, with any assignments? Like, um, can we always email you? I don't know if because some professors aren't good with emailing back, but I'm not sure if we can email you. I mean, you can. Yeah, I mean, if it, you know, if if you have a, I mean, and. I mean, I did see someone already took a stab at the pennies lab uh, that I haven't gotten back to it, to them on it. But yeah, I mean, if, if you look at the reports and you're doing, doing it early and there's you know, something that you're unsure about, then yeah, you can, you can email me and, and I will try and try and get back to you as quickly as I can uh, on, you. you know, on, you know, if it doesn't quite look right, uh, I can probably make a quick, course correction change on it, okay? Um, all right, and so for the conclusion, so the conclusion is really where, where the money is, okay? Uh, this is definitely done differently. It can be done differently amongst different classes. Hang on one second, I gotta, 
Um, all right, so one second, they have other assignments other than the labs and the journals. I don't, I don't think so. I think it's the labs, the journal assignment, the tests, a couple of quizzes, I mean, that's kind of, kind of enough for six weeks, right? I mean, I mean, if you want more, I can certainly give you guys more, but you know, I, I, for right now, usually the, usually the way that I, that I would do the, uh, any extra homework would be if the first test was an absolute bomb and we weren't doing well, then what I might do is assign practice problems or I might assign a homework to make sure that you're going in the right direction with your study. So I, this will probably be less of an issue with everybody doing, doing the quiz on, on online. But during a regular semester, I know where the average is supposed to be. And so when I have an average that's, you know, supposed to be around a 70 on, on the first exam, and I'm seeing it's in the high 50s, then it's either I'm not teaching the same class that I've been teaching the same way for 10 years, not the same way, or we're not quite getting the right focus of practice problems at home. And so then I may help you adjust to here, work these practice problems, these will help you to focus towards the next test. And that's when I might assign extra homework. But again, I don't assign extra busy, I don't assign busy work and things like that for shits and giggles. All right, it's not, I don't, I don't like making work for people to do unless it's absolutely necessary. Again, everything that I was trying to do for the class was meant to meet a learning objective. You were, there was a reason why we were doing the experiment. There was a focus and a purpose for everything that you did that was driving something that you're supposed to learn. Okay. Professor. Sure. Um, for as far as experiments go, are we supposed to do them like at home or? Um, I mean, there's, there's no like wet stuff, wet chemistry you're going to do. So everything you're going to do is at home, but it's there. It, most of it's going to be, there's some simulator things that are, it's a website that has, it has kind of everything set up and, and you can move the chemicals around and you can add stuff in and you can make solutions and you can play, play with basically the chemicals, but it's, it's in a, a virtual simulator. So everything's going to be online. You don't actually have any real chemicals that you have to work with. Yeah, okay. Cause um, the last class I had, so towards the end of semesters, uh, the teacher was making us do like uh, experiments at home no no there's there's no the only time that i ever had people do chemistry at home was when i assigned a um i'll try and find it we, we can we'll take a break uh here at some point but uh we did a there was a video that passed around on social media that's kind of like one of these like you know interesting science videos and like the first video was like some some like you know, weird uh, part where they took like a piece of coal and dipped it in peanut butter and then they heated it and then they broke, you know, and then they, they you know, brush it off and suddenly like there's something like shiny on the inside, like a piece of quartz or something. And it was, and so I, I gave it to my students to do at home to recreate the, the experiment and then posted a YouTube video of it to see what you actually get when you do that experiment. And so there's, so there isn't any chemistry to be done at home. Um, so, yeah, so everything's going to be online. So there's, yeah, there's nothing like that. Okay. All right. So the conclusion is really where the meat, meat of the labs are, right? Again, in different classes, this is described different ways or pro some professors look for different things in the conclusion. Sometimes they call it a discussion section. Sometimes it's called a summary. Sometimes it's called a conclusion. These are generally not synonyms. They don't really mean the same thing. Okay, so when we are things like discussion is really more of a conversation about the, the experiment, what you thought about it, 
and things like that. A summary doesn't necessarily imply analysis. A summary is simply, I did this, 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 and this, and now, and, and this is, you know, this is what, what the data was. And so a conclusion is really meant to be a, both a summary, but it's supposed to imply there's some analysis as in what is, what is the data mean? Okay. So for example, when you go to the doctor and you get a blood test, right. And they, and you log in and look at your, you know, my health portal, right. And you see the, your, your blood work panel that, that's on there. And it may or may not give you a range. Maybe it sometimes gives you a range of values of what's considered healthy, right? So you get your, you know, your cholesterol and they tell you, you know, normal range is between here and here and your number is here. And here's your triglycerides and normal range is here and here and your number is this. And your, you know, your blood urea level is, you know, normal or it's within, you know, here's the normal range, here's your number. But that doesn't really mean anything when we look at a whole big blood panel of everything, but your doctor will look at all of those different things and then see, okay, you know, this level is high, but this level is low. And that may indicate that there's something wrong with your liver. Right. And so there is some analysis of that information that means something in a wider context of your health. Okay. And so a conclusion is more of summarizing what's important, but also the analysis of what does that number mean? Okay. Now there may not be some further meaning in a lot of cases, but that's what the conclusion is supposed to be driving towards. All right. So let's look at, um, so when you write the conclusion, okay, so this will apply for the pennies lab. When you write the conclusion, I'm looking for a paragraph format and it's usually about a paragraph. Okay. If you write more than a paragraph, for any of these experiments, you probably didn't quite get it, okay? There's none of these experiments that are that long or that detailed that requires you to go on for a page, okay? Um, especially like things like just the penny lab. It's about the mass of pennies. There shouldn't be anything that you have to write a full page about, okay? So I'm looking for a paragraph. Okay, so this means like just a regular English paragraph. Okay, third person objective tense is, is generally how we write, which for simplicity, it means you take I, you don't put I, me, we, the experimenter. You don't talk about yourself in the third person. It's taking yourself out of the, the context of the writing. Okay, and so it is meant to put us into talking about things in an objective way. Okay. To remove our personal feelings and our person, our, our, what we did with the lab out. Okay. Um, sentences should be complete and logical. You should include data in the conclusion, right? Now, if we were doing this in the lab, right, and for like the physical properties lab, we, we measure out you know, masses of various samples in a little flask, right? Putting the mass of the flask, say the mass of the flask was 23 grams. Well, that, I mean, that is a piece of data, right? That is a number, it's a piece of data, but it's not important, right? So there's a, a certain amount of trying to learn to pick out what is the important, what is the important piece of data that I need in order to draw towards the conclusion, right? Um, but it should address, and so we want a, a paragraph that addresses what was the purpose of the experiment, right? So that's why going back to identifying what was the purpose of doing the experiment is a critical, is critically important because that helps you to write your conclusion, right? If, as I said last night, if the learning objective is that I want you to understand how, how to write a conclusion, Okay, how do I test that? What kind of, what kind of question or what, how, do I, how do I derive a metric that gets to understanding, right? How do I create a numerical system of understanding, right? It's too vague, it's too squishy to say, I want you to understand this, right? But if we talk about, and so 
when, when the labs are talking about, you know, just, you know, learning how to use various pieces of glassware, you know, how do, how do I know whether or not you learned that, right? That's not really an objective of, of the experiment. That's not the learning, the learning focus of that is very difficult to test, right? So that's where the purpose of each experiment has to be clearly defined. Why are we doing the experiment? Okay, why are we doing the experiment? How did we go about conducting that test? How do we go about conducting the experiment? And then what did we find? Okay. And so that brings me into, these are my general guidelines for how I often will guide people through doing some initial writing. Okay. Do you have this PowerPoint up on Canvas? Yes, it is. It's, it's up on Canvas. It's on the, uh, it's in the lab section. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the first part, first part is the purpose. Okay. What was the purpose of doing the experiment? Okay. Oftentimes we re reiterate this. It's kind of like having a hypothesis, right? What is, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish in the experiment? Okay. The methodology, how did we go about testing our hypothesis? How do we go about conducting our experiment? Right. Um, what were the results? Right. Now, sometimes, this is the conclusion of our lab. Like there's three, these three parts are often for most labs that we would do, this is kind of the end, right? So there may not be any further analysis, but sometimes there is. Like in 112, we do a, a hard water analysis lab, right? So if you're not familiar with hard water, right? You, in your, in your house, we have water that comes into our, into our house. Maybe you're from a well or you're from city water. And in any case, there's a certain mineral content of your, of your water. There's magnesium and calcium in your water, right? Um, same thing with natural amounts of fluoride, right? So you have magnesium and calcium, and if you have higher concentrations of that, it can give you what's called hard water, where you have an elevated calcium, magnesium content in your water. And this can generally result in things like you have, you have an increased you know, amount of soap scum in your, in your tub and things like that. So you get, or you get calcification around your, your, your spigots and things. So when hard water is a normal kind of just elevated amount of calcium in your water, right? So we did the experiment. So we say, okay, the purpose is to determine the, the hardness of our water, determine the calcium content of our water. We do this by titration. We titrate water samples against a standard. The result of the experiment is the water had 150 ppb or ppm of calcium. Okay, but me saying that your water has 150 ppm of, of calcium, that doesn't really mean anything to you, right? So the analysis then takes you one step further where you say 150 ppm of calcium means that your water is moderately hard. Okay. What does that number mean to me? All right. Uh, so the same, same thing is like, you, again, back to the blood test. If I tell you that your cholesterol is 140, is that a good number? Bad number? You know, you got low density, high density, like what, what, is, what does that number mean to me? Right. So then your doctor says, you know, this is, this number is bad. Okay. You should be down here below this other number. Okay, and you need to do this in order to, you know, having this higher, higher number is going to put you at risk of these other things, right? And so there's some analysis that goes in that goes with the number. Okay, so for some of our labs, there may not be any further analysis required, it may just be, this is the concentration that we got, and that's it, right? So the physical properties lab, for example, is very much like the hard water lab, we're looking for Co concentrations of calcium chloride, but that's all there is, right? There, there is no deeper philosophical meaning to the concentration of calcium chloride in your sample, right? So there is no real analysis that, that goes further, okay? So what I want you to think about when you write your conclusions is this, okay? In most of these labs, I am paying you, okay? We are in a 
as unfortunate as it is a, a capitalist market. And so I am paying you for, for results. Okay. I'm paying you for your answer. All right. And I pay you in points. Okay. So you write the lab report and I pay you in points. All right. So if the purpose, if I'm giving you a water sample and I want to know what is the concentration of calcium chloride and you don't tell me that in your conclusion, you don't tell me what I'm paying you for, then my question is, what did I pay you for then? Right? So if you are paying someone to install a fence and they go put two posts in, are you going to pay them for installing a fence when they put two posts in? Probably not. Right? So that's not what you've asked for. Right? And so the same thing here, you, I am your customer. Okay. I am paying for results. All right? So we should be focusing on, again, what does our customer want? Why am I doing the experiment? What am I being paid to deliver? Okay. And again, that goes back to some of the soft skills, customer focused, right? When you write a lab report and it looks like chicken scratch or you wrote it by hand. Okay. Which again is not, not unrealistic. Sometimes we have to do things by hand, but in most of these virtual cases, we're not doing that by hand. So your lab report should look, Nice. Okay. You should try to employ whatever soft skills you have to, to, to learn how to make a better presentation. Okay. That your report looks as, looks as a professional quality that you would give to your boss. Okay. Now maybe your boss doesn't care that, that you wrote, that you wrote, you know, his, uh, his lab or his, uh, uh, you know, his blood work down on a napkin and gave it to him but presumably you wouldn't want your doctor to give you a blood, a blood, you know, uh, panel written on a napkin, right? So you would want it to look nice. That make, that gives you confidence. They actually took, took your blood test and it wasn't, you know, they didn't send it down to Billy Joe Bob's tire nails and blood center, right? To, to, to get it taken care of. Okay. So this is what an example looks like. I don't know where that, that should open there. Okay. All right. So if we look at this, the way this reads, okay. Purpose is this is a paragraph. Okay. You see there are numbers present. So there should be numbers in your experiments and we're not doing uh, too much in the quanti uh, qualitative fashion. Okay. The purpose of the experiment is to determine the content of the water, otherwise referred to water hardness. Okay. The samples were tested using a pH titration. Okay. Again, the method, the titration was ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid or EDTA was standardized using a 200 ppm calcium chloride sample. Now, again, now this first part here is, is sort of misleading because I'm talking about the methodology, but people mistake this as regurgitating the procedure. Okay. Again, it is about summary, synthesizing information. I don't want a recap of your whole procedure. What parts were important? That's it. Okay. We have to work on figuring out what parts are important. Okay. That's the skill we have to develop. It's those critical thinking skills of what information is important. Do I need to pass on to my customer? Okay. In this case, using a 200 PPM standard is how we set the rest of the, the, the experiment up. Okay. The EDTA, had a standard concentration of this. Okay. There's two parts of the experiment. This is the result of part A. Okay. We took several samples and averaged them. Okay. And that was titrated against the tap water and found the had a calcium of 65 ppm. This value according to EPA indicates the water is moderately hard. Okay. So if we look at the different parts, okay, there's you know, part one, right? What was the purpose? There's a little bit of methodology in here. Okay. In step two, step three is, you know, what was the result? Okay. This has two, two pieces of data. There was two parts of the lab. Okay. Part A and part B, and then part four, the analysis. What does that mean? What does that 65 PPM mean? Okay. So it shouldn't have to ramble on for too long. 
okay? We should be working to synthesize, summarize, analyze the information, okay? So it's often harder to write less, okay? But we're, you don't have to start from what is an atom and work your way up from there in doing the experiments, okay? So again, knowing our audience is the first step of any amount of com any communication, okay? Who is my audience? What does my audience want? Okay, those are our two critical things that are important regardless of what class you're in. Okay, what is my audience and what does my audience need? Okay, and so in these cases, I am paying you for data, at which point putting data in there is important. But I don't need to know that it took you 50 milliliters and 25 milliliters and 30 milliliters and 45 milliliters. The, those values are irrelevant. They don't tell me anything, okay? If they, they don't tell me about the concentration, right? So this is learning about what pieces of data are important. And we'll talk about this in the different labs, okay? All right, so let's look at, again, the So this is the, in the lab one right here. So here's the, the lab report lecture, okay? It's the little link right there, right before the sample lab report. Okay, so that's the PowerPoint that I just went through, was that, was that link right there. Okay, all right, so let's look at the Penny Lab real quick, and then we'll probably take a break as we shift gears here. Okay, so in this case, it's four pages total, okay? These could all be in a Word document. The data page with the calculations, again, could be the Excel sheet that you copy and paste into Word. It could be just the Excel sheet by itself, all right? There's two graphs, all right? So if we look at the data, all right, we'll look at the data here in a second. One graph has the average year versus the mass, or uh, the year and the mass. The second graph has the year and the standard deviation. And the last page is the conclusion. Okay, so there is no purpose, there is no procedure, there are no pre lab questions, it is just these specifically four pages. And the focus here is more on the conclusion than anything else. Okay, uh, I, talk, I talk about like how to do, how to do the, the graphing. Okay, there's various tutorials over here on how to do uh, the, the different charts. Okay. So let me see if I can, if I've got the data already up. Okay. All right, so if you're not familiar with Excel, so this is again, it's another kind of one of these things where if you're not familiar with Excel, this is an added complication, obviously, to you. But if you're if you're doing some amount of Excel work, okay, we should know how to use Excel. Lots, of, most most professionals use use Excel. There's the equation for standard deviation. Is the STDEV? I believe that's outlined in the. It's probably in the the website page. Right. right, and so this is all you need for your, your data page, right, is the completed calculations with the mass, right, so that's page one, right. So let's take a look at or the graph, right. Sorry, I'm not great with working on my Mac here for this. Okay, and so then we're generally just gonna be inserting a graph. All right, and one thing that you'll find is that what that's handy is in most things for Excel, there are quick layouts, which you can pick from over here that kind of give you 
a variety of ways of displaying your information that include things like putting the access title in there. Okay, so if you want to do the do the labels on on here for the the mass of the pennies. Right, and this is obviously the the year. Right, labels every, everything should be labeled. Now, if you can't get the labels in here, now there was a, there was a question about you know what happens if we can't get that. You can put it in Word, and obviously you can try and fat finger the labels in there in, in a Word document. You can probably like insert a text and then just like move the text around so that you can you can put a label in there. Pages should be labeled. And so that the, the document should stand alone. Okay. This document should, I mean, the, the graph should should basically outline what it is, right? Um, and it should look you know, I mean, so so we get something that looks, you know, somewhat to this, and this, you know, and then then what you might do is, you know, put it as its own page, and then boom, there's your you, you your your second page that you're gonna do, right? And then of course we work again on our soft skills that we make this look nice that, you know, the labels are big enough. Again, I'm, you know, I'm, you know. Well, getting a little older, I need to be able to see. Not, I don't wear I don't wear glasses, but you know, you can make your you can make your axes large enough that anybody you know can can actually tell what what the data points are, right? Um, so everything is nice and labeled. You've got you know the the axes are labeled. The data points you know don't have to they don't have to be connecting the dots. Again, this isn't kindergarten. If you want all your dots connected, I can get my five year old to do it for you. You know, so you can just leave the dot, the data points as is, leave your raw data uh, alone, right? And so this would be page one, page two, page three would be the other graph, right? Would be the other graph, and then your conclusion, okay? If we look at those graphs, now obviously you already saw that first graph. There's clearly something going on. What would there be the other graph? What's that? What would be the third graph? I mean, the second. The second graph is the standard deviation. So it's the standard deviation versus the year. Okay. All right. So if we don't know about standard deviation, standard deviation talks about how far off of the average you are. So if we know where the average is, the standard deviation talks about how far off the average is the number. So the larger the standard deviation, the more the, it deviates from the average. All right. And so you may see some different trend occurring in here. Okay, and then the analysis. What does that mean? What what is happening with the data? Okay, what's happening with the trend? Okay, why why is it changing? Why why did it change? Why does it look different? Okay, so again, you're not working in a box. Okay, this you have other resources available to you. Use the resources you have available to you. Do not just like you know try and come up with answers on your own. Okay, if you don't know. Okay, learn, use resources you have, read a book, okay, pick something up, explore further, dig a little deeper, ask some further questions, and then get and then give me give me your answer. Okay, your conclusion of the change in the pennies over the year. What's happening to the pennies? Okay, so I want to know what is what are the, the trends we're seeing with, with respect to the to the pennies over the different years. Okay, so you got two graphs, data sheet, conclusion. Calculations do we need to include in these labs? It's for, for this one, it's just, just the average and standard deviation. For the I other mean, lab, for the other labs, to, uh, yeah, for like the other labs, equations yeah. or just have the fact that we did them on there? Uh, well, let me put it this way. For most of the labs, if you just put the data in there, okay, you can obviously include your, you can, you could hand write in your calculations if you wanted to, but you really don't need to because I'll know whether or not you're wrong just by looking at it. Okay, so for like example, for the, for the, for the calcium chloride lab, for the physical properties lab, when you tell me the density of your calcium chloride is 23 grams per mole, I'm going to know you're wrong. Okay, because your water shouldn't be more dense than mercury. 
right? So I'm going to know, know, know that you did something wrong and know where, where your calculations went wrong, probably without you having to tell me, okay? So you just put the data in there and write the, put, put the numbers in there and I, I can usually figure out the rest, okay? Uh, but that also brings me to grading these labs. All right, so here, here's, here's my, my, my method for, for grading, right? I am in general not overly concerned with whether or not you got the right answer, okay? Now, in most of these labs, since they are virtual and I have made up the data, there is a right answer, okay? Um, but for others, it's a little squishy, but I'm not as concerned about strictly whether or not you got the right answer, okay? So my focus is more on, uh, like for the calcium chloride lab, for example, okay? Normally when we do this in the lab, okay, I don't have, you would take an unknown, say your unknown is number five, okay? I usually don't have the answer for what is the actual concentration for unknown number five, okay? If you tell me the concentration is 10% calcium chloride, I will accept that that is your answer, okay? Pending that all of your data agrees with your conclusion, okay? So if I plug, if I check your data and your data actually says it's 45%, then I will consider you to be wrong because obviously you've made a calculation error, right? And then you're reporting to me an incorrect data based on the data you presented, okay? So if you presenting data that doesn't match what I do, when I check it, check your data, okay, I'm grading you based on your own data, okay? So if your own data doesn't agree with what you say it is, then I would say you're wrong. Okay, but I'm not specifically grading you on whether or not you got the actual right, right value. Okay, maybe the actual value for unknown number five was 20%. Okay, you said it was 10, your data says it's 45, you know, or data you collected said it was 45, and not, none of those numbers are right. Okay, so I'm not strictly as concerned about that you got the actual dead on right answer from the, from the answer key. Okay, I'm looking for how did you process your data? Did you do the data processing right? Do you have, is you, did you follow all of the lab format? Okay, when you wrote your conclusion, did you hit all the right points? Even if you were wrong and you told me that the unknown was 10%, your data set, your data agrees with you that it's 10%, that is the only conclusion that you could have drawn is that it's 10%. If that's what your data says, that's what you report, okay? Even if you knew that the actual answer was 20%, you cannot go with that answer. You must go with what the data says, okay? We have to follow what the data tells us. We don't have options to change data to be what we want it to be, okay? In science, we, we have to follow what the experimental data yields, okay? Where does the evidence lead us? If the evidence says the unknown is 10%, that is what you report, that is what I will believe, okay? It is where we get into trouble, where we knew that the unknown was supposed to be 20%, and we say it's 20%, even though that's not what the evidence says, okay? When we change data to fit what we want it to be, that's where we're wrong, okay? So, in most of these labs, I'm more looking for, did you understand the overall process? Did you go through all of the steps? Did you understand? Did you write a good conclusion that's, that is substantiated by your data? Did you use data in your conclusion? Did you hit all the pertinent points? Did you, or did you leave everything out? Did you, did you tell me that, you know, thank you, Dr. Jensen, we took your blood work. Thank you for your copay. What, what did you find from my blood work, right? If you leave out the data that I was paying you for, okay, that's, those are the issues that I'm looking for. Those are the mistakes that, 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 I'm, that I'm more looking for, okay? So, you know, and you will probably find that at some point, if you are 
woefully, woefully off track where you wrote your lab report in Klingon and gave it to me. And it is absolute a hot mess. I will probably give you, you know, a nominal point for trying and tell you to do it again. And I will give you some advice on, you know, you're, you're way, you're way out of, out of, uh, out in left field. You need to bring it back over here and try again. And then I will usually let people, I, in the past, I have done things where I will, I use it as an iterative learning process. Okay. Where I will make you keep redoing it until you get it right. But each time you get less and less points, but in, in any case, you don't just start off with like, the five out of 30 that I give you, you have some, some ability to redeem yourself, but also along the way you're learning. You learn by making mistakes. That's how we learn in general is we make mistakes. We make mistakes and then we make corrections and we learn to do things better, right? And so my, my real goal for most of the lab work is that you don't keep making the same mistakes as we get through each one of the labs, okay? So that's why I kind of do the half, the partial lab up front, see what mistakes we can, what, I, what mistakes I can catch real quick in the conclusion writing, and then nip that in the bud before we get to the first lab report, before we get to the first real lab. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's most of the stuff for the lab stuff. Again, take a, take a look at the, the lab page and the pennies stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two minute break here. Take a two minute break and then we're going to come back and we're going to start chapter one. Okay. All right. So I'm going to pause the recording here for a minute and then we'll come back with chapter one. Okay. So just a little quick stretch break here. All right. So here we're going to start chapter one. All right. We're just going to have a quiz next week on chapter one. It is going to be multiple choice. So we didn't really talk, talk much about the, the tests. They're all multiple choice, okay? Uh, they are done on the Canvas site. I will activate them and there will be a link on the Canvas site. And so then you will essentially just click on the link, do the test in one shot, and then you will get a grade right away, okay? It has the right answers in there. It gives you the answers and then, or tells you whether or not you got the answer right or wrong and then you'll have your, have your grade as soon as, as soon as you're done, okay? Um, so the only thing really for, that takes time in grading is dealing with the, the lab reports, all right? So the tests and things, you'll know what your grade is right away. So in the first chapter, okay, we have a few learning objectives, okay? The first being the scientific method. Okay, we're gonna look at the scientific method. I'm gonna talk about various parts of the scientific method, and then you should, um, uh, be able to differentiate various parts. All right, so there's a question about whether or not it's timed. So yes, there is a time on the tests. Uh, it's online, so if I don't give you a time, I feel like making it timed at least presents some level of difficulty, right? So if we're in the, you know, obviously, most people can make a cupcake, make a good cupcake, but if I only give you 30 minutes to make a good cupcake, then the pressure is on if you make a good cupcake, right? So uh, it's, there is a time limit on the test and on the quizzes, okay? All right, so the units of measurement, so we are gonna be looking at the metric system. So if you're not familiar with the metric system, there is some amount of memorization that has to be done for some of this usually at least when i do a test usually uh i don't give the metric system units you have to kind of memorize some of those there will be some use of density so we're going to learn about using density and we should be able to do uh various conversion units of mass to volume using the density we'll talk about significant figures this applies when we do various kinds of math uh, addition and subtraction, multiplication and division, you should be able to identify the proper number of significant figures. Usually significant figures plays a role more when we do lab work, but since we're not actually doing any real lab work, it's less of an actual 
thing. So the first quiz will have the significant figures, which applies to you know how many digits should my answer have when I do math. But most of the tests are going to be multiple choice. So the answers are already in the right number of significant figures. So uh, really the first test is, or the first quiz is really where the significant figures are going to be important, right? And then reading measurements. And so a lot of this is, if we look at some instrumentation, what is the number off the instrument? Okay, so we, how do we read a, a volumetric flask, right? Or a graduated cylinder. If a number, like do we read at the top of the bubble, the bottom of the bubble, you know, how many digits do I get off of a piece of glassware, that kind of stuff. Okay, so we should be able to read glassware appropriately. And so this really involves me giving you pictures of various kinds of glassware, and then you telling me whether or not, you know, what the measurement reading is. All right, so some of this is early just terminology, various things they'll use throughout the course, things that are not, I'm not quizzing you on. Okay, I'm not, this is obviously a section that's not the, the for, of the learning objectives, okay? So we already talked about what chemistry was yesterday, the study of matter and energy, and matter being anything that occupies space. We'll talk a lot about elements, okay? Elements are the simplest form of matter, okay? Where we cannot break it down any further, okay? So we can break down things into their simplest form being elements. So elements are the Lego blocks, the building blocks of everything, okay? So when we talk about an element, we, can't, we don't subdivide an element. We can have different kinds of substances. An atom may be of an individual element, right? Uh, we'll talk about there are chemical bonds between various things. And so that's what holds everything together. So the bonds can be broken, they can be rearranged. And so throughout some of the course, we'll talk about the various ways that molecules reorient, reorient themselves. Right. A compound is really a combination of elements. So sometimes you'll see compounds, sometimes you'll see molecule. These are pretty much mean the same thing. Okay, so a molecule and a compound are, are I'll, I'll use interchangeably, right? So, but they generally have a specific composition. Okay, so they, if I talk about water, there is a specific definite organization of what water is. Okay, and we're going to learn about chemical nomenclature. How do we name molecules? All right. And so we'll, we, we'll deal with mixtures of various things. So we'll see uh, compounds and mixtures. So here we have elements. So these are two different elements, right? And so here we have two compounds. So it's maybe it's like, you know, carbon monoxide and water. And then we have mixtures of various things where we can have mixtures of elements, we can have mixtures of molecules and compounds. Okay. Um, a mixture is really just two or more substances. Okay, when we put them physically together, we get a mixture of things. So we will talk about things that are more aqueous, okay, aqueous mixtures. So that's in liquid or so or dissolved in water. We'll talk about gas mixtures. Um, Mixtures can be heterogeneous and homogeneous, right? So these are just defining the kind of composition. So heterogeneous means that you could tell that there's different parts. So usually a mixture of this would be like, um, as you, you know, if you put sand in water, you can tell where the sand is and where the water is. It's not homogeneous. So like most of our beverages and things, or like, in my, in my beverage, you know, it's heterogeneous and that I can see the particles of ice floating in there, right? Versus the, the rest of the liquid, my rest of my tea is homogeneous. I can't pick out the, the sugar molecule from, from the tea particles, from the caffeine and things like that that are in there. Okay, so a heterogeneous is really just looking at things that are not as uniformly mixed. All right, we'll talk about, about solutions. Okay, solutions are really just things that are mixed in various phases. So we can have gas solutions. We will have, talk about more about aqueous solutions. So really water is our major component. And so anytime we put stuff in water, we get a solution. Uh, we're not really gonna talk about metals 
so much. So there are solid phase solutions. They're called alloys. We're not going to really deal with a lot of inorganic chemistry. So we will talk about some, some gas solutions. All right. So, so in matter, so this is kind of just, again, breaking down some of those terms. So we have elements, we have compounds, we have heterogeneous and homogeneous solutions. So heterogeneous and homogeneous fall into mixtures and we can have pure substances. So we can have a pure compound, right? So a, a solution of pure water, right? Is just going to be water. It's, it's still pure. There's nothing mixed in there. It is just water molecules, but they are compounds. They are molecules, right? Or we can have pure elements. All right. Throughout the course, we will talk about things like physical properties. That's one of our first labs is talking about the physical properties, such as things like density. So density is a physical property. It's a property that describes or identifies a substance. So water, for instance, has a specific density, right? So we know that, or you will learn that water has a density of about one gram per milliliter. Right, whereas ice has a density that's less than water. That's why it floats on top. Right, um, so it's one of the few, it's the only substance that I can think of off offhand where the solid is less dense than the liquid. Right, but density is a physical property of the material. When water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, that is a physical property of water. Right, now that doesn't mean that it's unique to water. There may be other substances that also boil at 100 degrees, but it is unique in that water always boils at that, at that amount. It is unique. It is a property of that material. Okay. There are chemical properties, which are the reactions that things undergo. So we'll see this in some of the later chapters when we do chemical reactions. Okay. These are things like oxidation and reduction. The gain and loss of electrons, a substance uh, have. So substances will naturally gain electrons. Some substances naturally lose electrons. So these are chemical properties of the material, but it depends on what they interact with. So it's not just a, it's not a physical property. It's more of a, it interacts with something else and loses electrons. So it becomes a chemical property because it's a reaction uh, that it undergoes. All right. Intensive and extensive properties. So these we'll talk about here again as we get to things like density. Okay, so extensive property depends the on the amount of substance. So if I want to know the weight of something, so weight is an extensive property. If I have a glass of tea or I have a gallon of tea, they're going to weigh different things based on the amount of stuff. Okay, this is called an extensive property. Intensive properties are the same regardless of the size. So the density of water, the density of a cup of water, or the density of a gallon of water are the same. It doesn't matter how much water I have. Water has the same density. The, the property is the same regardless of how much stuff there is, okay? Because it is a, it's a function of mass and volume. So they scale with one another. If I have more, if I have more volume, I also have more mass. And so when I take those two terms in, into relation with one another, they're the same as if I have a cup of water. Okay. All right. So here we have something of like some of our phases. So we're going to talk about gases. We're going to talk about liquids and we're going to talk about solids. Now I'm not going to belabor what, these three are. Most people have some general context of what a liquid and a solid are and what a gas is. We breathe the air, it's a gas. We drink water, it's a liquid. We are a solid and, and, and et cetera. Okay. So the only difference here from a chemical perspective are that solids are generally closely packed to one another. The molecules are generally closely packed to one another. So they, they generally have, they're generally incompressible. So we generally don't compress solids more, uh, very much more. And while they are uh, rather ordered, they still vibrate. So even at the, at the molecular level, molecules are still moving, 
even if we don't see them move. Okay, so even the static picture of the atoms being little balls next to one another, there's always some little, even if they're stuck together, they're gonna sit there and wiggle next to one another. There's always some motion of the atom. The atoms are always in motion, all right? There's different kinds of solids, okay? We, one of the things that most people like are things like crystalline solids, right? So everybody likes the crystalline solids because they, because they look pretty, right? So if you've been down to the, uh, National, uh, to the Natural History Museum, you've gone to the gem, ex gem exhibit, you know, that's, everybody likes to go in there and see, see all the pretty gems. And those are examples of crystalline solids, okay? Uh, they have generally a ordered geometry, and so we see that in things like obviously salt and diamonds and sugar, all right? They create uh, crystalline structures. Yes, all right, thank you. You're not helpful. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, you're not helpful, thank you. All right, We're, all right, so, and then we have amorphous solids. Okay, so amorphous solids are, they don't have a strict uh, structure, okay? So we see these things in like plastics and charcoal and glass. I mean, they have molecular structures, but they're not, uh, they're not rigid, all right? So we can get crystalline plastics. There are crystalline plastics, but uh, generally these structures tend to be kind of just all over the place, right? Um, liquids. Again, most of these same properties are, are the same as what we expect of all liquids, right? They take up the shape of their container, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a lot of the same thing with gases. There's a lot of empty space when we deal with gases. One of the main things that we'll deal with when we get to the gas chapter, which is later on in the semester, is really this ability for expansion of gas. So the, the expansion and compression. So the ability that we, the fact that we can compress gases under pressure changes some of its physical properties. Okay. Um, when we talk about things like physical changes, really we're talking about altering their appearance. So if I boil water or I freeze my water, right, I can get my water back. Okay. These are physical changes. Generally, they are just changing the appearance or the state without altering the actual composition. So my ice cubes are not a different composition than my water. Okay. So physical changes are generally thought of to be reversible. Okay. So if, my, if I freeze my water, my ice cube, I can melt it and get my water back. Right. A chemical change may alter the composition altogether. Right. If I fry an egg, all right, I'm not going to get my original egg back. Okay, some common physical changes that you'll see are things like boiling and condensation. Okay, these are the opposites, melting and freezing. And a new new word in here that you may or may not be familiar with is sublimation. Okay, sublimation is what we see for dry ice, and that's why we why it's called dry ice. It doesn't have a liquid phase. It goes from the solid directly to the gas. That's sublimation. All right. Uh, dissolving things in water, again, is generally, generally a physical change. Usually we can get the stuff back, okay? So if I uh, put salt in water, I could boil the water off and get my salt back, right? I, could, I can physically separate them, all right? Chemical changes tend to be things like oxidation, okay, rusting. If my bridge rusts or my you know, metal rust, I can't, I can't get it back, right? There's no, there's no fixing this. All you can do is take it apart and put new stuff down, right? Um, when you burn your propane, you can't get your propane back, okay? It has been chemically changed into carbon dioxide and water, right? When we fry our egg, we can't get the original egg back. The proteins have changed physically uh, or from a, in a chemical uh, arrangement, and so we can't get the original things back. Okay, so chemical changes are generally thought to be irreversible in nature. No, all right, well, I wasn't expecting this to show up, so the, uh, I'll, we'll do the poll everywhere pro probably tomorrow after I get 
uh, get those more more fixed. All right. Thank you. Yes, you're not helpful. Thank you. All right. So again, a lot of that is just terminology. Okay. I'm not quizzing you on those things. Those are just words that you should be familiar with that you will see throughout the see me use throughout the semester. And that just in general, we should have some knowledge of. You're killing me here, guy. Okay. All right. All right, so um, all right. So the last part that we'll probably end up with tonight is just to talk about the scientific method, okay? So here, what, what you should be able to do is you should be able to describe the scientific method. You should be able to distinguish between hypothesis, theory, and law, and we should be able to identify a process within the scientific literature. So this is where I use like, this is, this is not specifically where you might see a test question or a quiz question on this. This is more of something that I may use within the journal article assignments, or I generally test your knowledge of in other ways, like the lab reports and things like that. So this is not specifically something I may ask questions on on the quiz. Okay. Um, you should be identified. You should be able to identify the different parts for sure. Okay. But identifying a process or, or how it's used in, in real life, is generally something I would do in a, in a different uh, venue other than the quiz. All right, so in every science class, there is a lecture or some explanation of the scientific method, okay? We always pretty much start here and then go from here because this is really what science is about. Science and the scientific method are synonymous in our that they are an approach to understanding things. Okay, it is a methodology to determining how wh whether or not we know things to be true or not. Okay, you know, distinguishing fact from fiction, from understanding how the world works, and so it is a method, a process that we go through. Okay, so it has always been a human preoccupation to understand the world around us, okay, to understand our universe. And so, but this provides us a method for doing it reliably. Okay, so there's a different couple of different parts of this. Okay, so you're going to notice as we go through this, that there are little arrows that go back and forth. Right. And that is on purpose because it is a process. It is an iterative process. It is meant to be redone. And it's called why they call it research because we search and then we research and then we search again and we research again. Okay. So most of this starts off with a hypothesis. Right. Uh, I posted um, a video that is and, and also a link. I'll show you guys that that in just a minute. Right, that's well worth your time to, to to listen to. It's not me talking. It's uh, it's it's a you know, famous physicist talking about the uh, scientific method. Right. So the hypothesis is our initial observation of you know available information. Okay, and then we develop an experiment in order to test whether or not that hypothesis is supported. Okay. So we may start with a guess, right? Again, uh, the fan physicist that I that I that I quote is you know Dr. Richard Feynman. He is you know famous physicist, um, you know, won Nobel Prize and things like that. And he talks about you know how we, we how we discover scientific laws, and it starts with a guess, and you know and that it's it starts with our hypothesis. How do we what do we think is going on? And so we develop a experiment to test our hypothesis of what do we think is happening and a good experiment is one in which or a really good experiment would be in one in which it delivers us a binary answer okay uh, if i think that or if we're testing to whether or not a a vaccine is effective right we would develop an experiment 
to test its efficacy, right? And so the answer is either going to be, yes, it's found to be effective based on the statistical guidelines, or it's not effective based on the statistical guidelines, right? So it gives us a yes or no answer of whether or not our hypothesis was correct. Now, obviously lots of science that we do nowadays is very complex. Generally, when you read scientific literature, there is not a strict specific hypothesis. Usually we're trying to get at something very complex. And so the hypothesis itself is, is a little complex. And so oftentimes experiments are complex. And so that's why data analysis tends to be, you know, again, a, where we have to focus a lot of time on in, and redoing experiments in order to, to validate data that we get. So information that we get out of experiments leads us to theory, okay? Now, theory is our, our knowledge of everything, okay? It's everything we know about what's going on, all right? Scientific law is our observations that are always found to be true, okay? You'll notice here a common misconception. Theory does not become law. There is no arrow here that says theory to law. Okay. A theory does not become a law. Okay. A theory is like the dictionary. Okay. We put all of the words in the dictionary. It is everything we know about a language and, and how and how things work in, in, in the dictionary. Okay. But you know, the dictionary does not become an essay, right? So there may be essays that are included in, you know, that have words from the dictionary, right? But they don't, they're not necessarily related to one another, okay? So a good hypothesis is one that can be tested and proven wrong, okay? So we want to be able to test whether or not our hypothesis is wrong, right? And you know, one thing that, you know, Dr. Feynman talks about things like, you know, people develop, you know, poor hypotheses that are very vague. So if you have a vague hypothesis, it's hard to prove that hypothesis wrong, right? So they think it's a good, a good hypothesis because it can't, because you can't prove it wrong, right? But a good hypothesis is one that we can experiment, okay? And so we want to develop good experiments in order to understand whether or not our hypothesis is correct. Are we explaining the phenomenon well enough that explains something else in general? Okay, so we set up all kinds of experiments. There's all kinds of ways that we can develop experiments from, you know, physically mixing things together, from looking at, you know, human populations. We can look at data and statistics, and we can look at longitudinal studies of things over time. Um, we can do modeling and simulations. There's all kinds of ways that we can test things, okay? So a scientific law, again, is, is an observation that is generally always found to be true, okay? It, if the experiment, if it doesn't, it, it follows experimental design, right? So your, your, the scientific laws don't really do mechanisms. So for example, the example I usually use is things like the law of gravity, okay? So there is the law of gravity and their gravitational theory. Gravity is both a law and a theory, okay? But they're not the same thing, okay? So you can have both. So gravitational theory is everything we know about gravity, right? Everything we know about the phenomenon of gravity. But the law of gravity is a mathematical equation, okay? It doesn't explain, it has no explanatory power. Okay, it's, it doesn't describe how things do what they do, right? It, it is a mathematical value that talks about that objects are attracted to one another based on the inverse or square of their relation of their distance, right? Um, and we find that it's always true. It uh, occurs with, with all of our, it concurs with all of our experimental data, right? Um, some of the laws that we're going to talk about in this semester will be things like Avogadro's law, Boyle's law, Charles' law, Hess's law, and Le Chatelier's principle or equilibrium law. All right. So 
one of our first laws that we that I talked about the other day was law of conservation of mass. Okay, that this was initially postulated by Lavoisier in 1785, right? But it wasn't fully explained until we had the atomic theory, okay? John Dalton describing the, the fundamental breakdown, the fundamental makeup of alv atoms, right? So we, we find that the law works for all of these, these kinds of reactions, but we find that it breaks down under like different kinds of nuclear reactions. Right. So, but so we have to revise the 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 laws as we understand the the materials. Right. We didn't have nuclear chemistry until the 20th century. Right. So in the 17 1800s, everything fit in the law of conservation of mass until we start subdividing the atom. Right. Um, same thing with like Newtonian physics, right? So Newtonian physics works perfectly well for most things until we find like, you know, Mercury's orbit doesn't quite fit in with the, the, the Newtonian uh, physics for the motion of the planets. So we have to kind of redefine, there, there's some finite adjustments that have to be made in that we see where that, that, then we get the, uh, you know, general relativity that begins to create a finer picture, right? So if you think about it, like, um, uh, I don't know, I, I keep, uh, oh, the, the kids game Minecraft, right? So all the, all the characters have big blocky heads, right? So, you know, that looks all well and fine. You obviously get a picture of what a person looks like, but they got a big blocky head, right? So, but eventually, as we chip away the blocks and we get a better, more refined kind of 3D image, we get a better picture of what a person would look like rather than the blocky 3D uh, picture. So over time, our understanding of phenomenon become more finely tuned. And so we begin to chip away at the surface until we get to a more a finer uh, understanding of, of nature. Then we get to scientific theory. Okay, so again, the theory is everything we know about a phenomenon. Okay, so we are learning about uh, atomic theory. So everything we learn here is a part of atomic theory. We are learning about atoms, right? But our idea of theory from a scientific perspective is not the same as the colloquial term of theory, okay? A scientific theory is a well-substantiated explanation of the natural world that's based on facts and it's confirmed through observation and experimentation. It is everything we know about something, okay? So gaps in, in our understanding do not, under, do not undo our understanding, okay? If I misspell congratulations in the dictionary, that does not undo the entirety of the, the English language, right? The dictionary is not rendered moot because there's a misspelling or a misprint, right? Or we are unsure of a clear definition of what do we call phenomenal consciousness, right? If, if I'm going to define well-being, right? And there's not a good clear definition of well-being, that doesn't mean the entire dictionary is, is useless, right? The theory is everything we know about a phenomenon. Okay, it is considered the pinnacle of human understanding of, of, of a phenomenon. Okay, so theories do not become laws. Okay, they're not linear. And gaps in our understanding do not invalidate what we do know. Okay, our gaps in understanding are what drive us to continue to ask questions. Okay, to refine those models and chip away at the Minecraft. Uh, square person to get down to the the more perfect you know statue of david look of we've chipped away all of the granite to to the better representation of what is a person right um so for most scientists we'd say scientific theory is no different than fact okay these are facts Okay, facts are what comport with reality. Okay, everything that we know about reality 
these are facts, okay, until proven otherwise. Now, there's always some experiment that further validates things, but we won't know that, you know, we're, we're, we're not wrong until later, okay? But that's why we continue to do experiments, right? That's why we continue to refine our experimentation, all right? Now, obviously, people, when people talk about things being just a theory, they're generally only talking about one particular thing. And we're not talking about, you know, germ theory. You know, no one has a problem with, you know, Lewis theory or atomic theory in general, right? But these are all part of the same methodology. It's all part of the same scientific method. The same amount of, you know, rigor goes into all of these different things. Um, some people may quibble about string theory and things like that as to how relevant those are, but and again, those are uh, still science. Um, so here's my general kind of example of how we look at uh, the application of the scientific method. Okay, take the moon for example. Okay, oh, hang on. All right, all right. So we have an observation. We have a moon. Okay, most civilizations figured out that there was something up there. Right. Every day they looked up and they saw there was a moon and they saw there was a sun. We, we obviously have these two objects in, in, in the sky. Right. So the question becomes, well, how did we get them? Okay. How did that get there? Right. So there were three competing hypotheses about how did the moon get there? One of them being fission. Okay. So usually when I do this in class, I usually have my little cup of water. So usually fission is defined as, you know, as the earth was spinning around when we were in the early earth, it was spinning so fast that a little globule flung off. And then that became part of our moon. And that little extra globule, like, you know, if I'm spinning my water around, these little water particles come out all over the place, right? Or we co-accretion or capture it. So it's kind of like a, a binary star where the two suns kind of get captured in each other's orbit. So the earth was here and the moon and the, you know, some, some big rock was just floating through our solar system and it just kind of got caught in our gravity and boom, it, we, we, got, we just got our extra moon, right? Uh, or we had a giant impact, something hit us and it sprayed off a particle of stuff. So these were three competing hypotheses. They said, okay, we have to develop an experiment in order to determine which hypothesis is right, okay? Or which hypothesis is wrong, okay? So we went to the moon, we collect moon samples. Right, so we bring back the mineral comp, we bring back the rocks, and so we're going to test mineral composition. Right, so our experiment is going to we, we predict that our experiment will yield three different results. Okay, either they're going to be the same mineral composition as the earth. Okay, at which point, if I spin my water glass around, the water droplets that come out of my water glass are going to be the same composition as the water in my glass. Right, or if it's entirely alien, it had no contact with this. Again, we can tell asteroids, we can tell the mineral composition of meteorites are different than anything on Earth, right? They have a much different mineral composition, right? Or it might be some mixture, right? And so what we find is that the mineral content over here in the corner is that it's similar, but not identical. Okay, so it rules out that it's totally alien, right? That it, we just didn't capture it. There's no way that it would have a similar mineral content if it didn't have some contact with us. You know, again, it's the same, same way as genetics, right? We know that from Mendel's law of heredity, okay, that a mommy bird and a daddy bird get together and have baby birds. And so the baby birds will have the same kind of genetics as the mommy and daddy bird. Right? We pass our genetics down to, to the next generation. So the baby bird's not going to have the same genetic, a similar genetic code to a tiger, be, you know, unless there was some relation, right? So we're not going to get a similar mineral contact unless there's some relation to our, to our planets and how we formed, right? And so we find, okay, well, it's not alien. And it's certainly not identical, so it didn't just spin off of us. Because again, when the Earth was molten and you know just a big gooey mass, 
the particle that flung off would be that same molten gooey mass as, as it was as the Earth. So we would expect them to be the same, right? So they're not identical and they're not totally alien. So the question is, okay, then we must have, something must have hit us enough that we mixed our, our DNA, okay? We mixed our mineral content. So then we create computer models to explain how things happen, okay? And so we get, you know, uh, computer modeling that generates a statistical composition of how would, how would something have hit us? What's, how big was it? How, you know, how would it have had to strike us? You know, in what way in order to get approximately that kind of mineral composition for, for our moon, okay? And so we validate data through further simulation and modeling in order to get to the results that we know from the mineral composition. Okay, and I think there's actually a second, uh, now that we've actually started to do more work on the moon, I think there's actually a second, they think there was actually a second uh, object that hit the moon and kind of molded over the back. It was like kind of a slow impact and kind of molded over the back because the back side of the moon is the, the crust is thicker than on the front side. So they think something kind of hit it and molded over it uh, at, at some point as well, right? But we gather evidence from a variety of sources, okay? So oftentimes people say, well, how do we know, how do we know this stuff? We weren't there, right? We weren't there, you know, to see things evolve. We weren't there to see the moon happen. It's like, well, but we have evidence, okay? A detective doesn't have to watch, visibly watch the crime in order to solve what happened. Right? We collect evidence. We have, you know, if you're if you're going out, you know, doing, you know, doing villainy nowadays and you leave your phone on you, you know, you're gonna get caught because you're basically holding a GPS tracker on, on on you at all times. They know where you're at. So you're not gonna say, Oh, I wasn't over at so and so's house. And it's like, well, your phone was there, where were you? You know, and so we can track together all these different pieces of data in and then we create modeling and simulations and then we can piece together everything that happened without having to physically be there, okay? There's all kinds of data we can collect if we just know where to look, right? So one of my examples that I, that I often use uh, too here to, to further kind of nail this home here as we, as we wrap up, right, is looking at evolution, okay? Love evolution, one of my favorite uh, pieces of science, and so, uh, I like to talk about bears as an example, okay? Everybody understands bears, right? So usually in class, I would have you guys chime in on what kinds of bears do we see here, okay? So usually most people identify the brown bear, right? The polar bear, the panda bear, and the brown bear or black bear, but actually these are all black bears. Black bears come in different shades, right? So like my, golden retriever and you know someone else's dachshund right they're still dogs they are they're just different they come in a little bit different varieties so bears actually are very similar so you can actually get blonde and brown varieties of black bears and so so we look at you know we have the hypothesis we think these species are related to one another so we conduct experiments we look at their bones okay we can look at the bone structures of these different animals we can look at their diet, their behavior, their environment, and their genetics. And we can pull all these pieces of data together to understand what is their relationship, if any, okay? Are they related or are they not related, right? So if they have, you know, similar bone structure, they have similar, you know, they may have different diets, right? So obviously the panda bear does not interact with polar bears right? They have different diets, they have uh, different behaviors, they have different environments, and so they're going to have different bone structures and things like that, but we can see in their DNA a statistical conservation of the genes, okay? We can see their interrelation to one another from their genes, so, and we can tell that they're different species, okay? And we can tell that they're different species because of their differences, but we can also see their familial relationships because of, we, we see things in their DNA, right? So we know uh, that things like the polar bear evolved from bound bears, 
And so we can see kind of the evolution over time of where like those black bears that appear in different shades that we can come up with how the mechanism of how they would have evolved over time in order to that gave them an evolutionary advantage to hunting in snow right because obviously the black bear would stand out incredibly uh well against a white background and so therefore he's not catching any seals with with his black coat right but a lighter coat and lighter coat begin to uh, give a predatory advantage to descendants. And so they they over time become separated enough that they become separate species. Uh, another thing, one cool thing that we also find in, uh, in some animals is cytochrome C, right? It's used for oxygen transport, okay? The molecule is, is it's a phenomenal molecule and it, it has, there are 10 to the 93 functional variants of this molecule. Okay, so what this means here is you could, there are 93 zeros with this 10, okay, a number with 93 zeros. That's how many different variations there are of this molecule that's, that function in the same way. So there is no reason why every species would have the same cytochrome C unless we are related to one another and is passed down heredity, uh, from heredity. Uh, because there's so many different, different ones. We could, every species on the planet could have their own cytochrome C, okay? But we don't. We share a similar cytochrome C and is also coded from 10 to the 49th different genome sequences or amino acids could code for this, for, for this protein. So there's no reason why we would code the same protein. These things are so phenomenally different that there is no reason why the different species wouldn't have different ones unless we were, there was some relation. You know? And so when we look at things like bears, for example, you know, there, there's all kinds of scientists who study bears that look at all kinds of different species that c collect all kinds of samples and data. And so we can look at, uh, you know, publications of just, just one genus. So one, you know, one set of animals that people study. And there is a mountain of evidence about bears alone as, as a species, of, uh, as a collection of animals that we understand how they're related to one another. Right. And so this is just one genus of animal and that's of the millions or, you know, tens of millions of species of things. Right. So the rest of these are just re coming back to look at, you know, gravity as a law, but also it's, it's theory. So again, the, the idea here that, the law doesn't really tell us about um, about what happens. You know, it doesn't explain about things. So, like when light passes a black hole, what happens to it? You know, light doesn't have any mass, but we know that it that it is distorted by the high gravity. That it changes as a function of the high gravity. So the law of gravity doesn't describe what happens when an object passes something with sufficiently high gravity, that how it, it changes its course, how it affects uh, its, its the, the very time itself. So we refine our ideas of our understanding of nature through different, different theories. Again, the theories are the chipping away of our understanding of the, the rudimentary square head of the Minecraft person to get down to a more robust, more fine-tuned image of what a person is, right? As we pick models that begin to drill down a little further that make slight tweaks to our information that get us a little bit closer, that 
fine tune our understanding a little bit more. You know, they don't necessarily replace other ones. I mean, Newton's, you know, uh, grab it, you know, Newton's theories still hold true for the bulk of things that we study. Okay, we can get just as fine results of uh, using Newton, Newtonian physics that we don't have to go to, uh, to, to, you know, string theory or quantum, you know, quantum mechanics or re general relativity in order to understand the motion of, of our planet. Okay, we don't need to go to that much detail. Okay, but for other things, there's slight adjustments that where these new, these other theories expand our understanding and get us down into to dealing with the the slight nuances of how things work. Okay. All right. So we're going to stop there. All right. So we're going to stop here tonight. So tomorrow we will start up with our our metric system. Okay. So. Uh, again, tonight I was just covering really the first thing. The next couple parts will come pretty quick because a lot of the, the metric system and dimensional analysis go pretty quick. Uh, I will have some uh, videos on practice problems and things like that. Again, I can't, it's hard to do the practice problems on the video call with everyone here. So I'll probably do separate videos, especially now that they've kind of changed the Zoom thing and like I can't. Uh, record from my phone and get it recorded because I, I did a practice problem the other day and it was you know me sitting here writing on stuff and it's just a picture looking at my face and not the not the camera uh, so I have to do separate videos for practice problems so I'll post those up as I as I do them um, but uh, a lot of these are kind of connected to one another so these these next sections will go go pretty quick okay all right so I did so I would focus on the starred slides for you know, just basic information that I was um, looking for. And so again, that's really just the, the theory and, and law de uh, definitions are my two starred slides and, and the, the whole, the method, you know, the scientific method was, was again starred. So if you're looking for study guide material, I would pull those slides out particularly. And again, none of these other slides are starred because again, a lot of that was just background information. Okay. And so I would try to, I would look ahead and I would probably start doing some memorization of the metric system. So again, you will probably need the metric system. So if you're not familiar with it, uh, this is something generally I would have you memorize. So you may want to look ahead a little bit and do some memorizing on that stuff. Okay, and again, we'll talk about that all tomorrow. Okay. And like I said, hopefully uh, audio wasn't too bad tonight. I will have a better microphone tomorrow. And so we will try to uh, see how that goes tomorrow. And that's all I have for you tonight. I will hang around for questions and comments. And then we will pick up where we left off tomorrow, same time.